Hey everybody, welcome to the Catholic Influencers Podcast. A conversation to help Catholic influencers like you and me to go deeper and further in influencing our world for Jesus. I'm your host, Father Rob Gallia. And I'm your co-host, Danny Sullivan. And today we look forward to talking to you about evangelical poverty. What it means to be poor and for Jesus to have been poor. Now, this is a, a bit of a debate. Like, was Jesus actually poor? I mean, this is something that people often ask. I mean, the, the, he, he had a home. He wasn't homeless. He had his father, Joseph, had a job. Um, he was a carpenter. So probably he had a bed to sleep on. He had some kind of security. And they could enjoy pilgrimages as well. And they they obviously weren't among the rich because they offered a dove when Jesus was was dedicated to the temple. So they didn't offer... You could have a choice between offering a goat or a, a dove if you were poor and so they offered a dove so we know he wasn't rich but was he actually poor i don't know so and what do you think danny i don't know i only just learned about the dove and the goat 20 seconds ago (laughs) so there you go but that's it that is in the bible that they offered that they went to buy um a dove and then they offered that uh, as a a dedication sacrifice but um, today we get to talk about poverty and what it means to be evangelically poor you know poor in spirit in other words what it means to be poor in spirit not necessarily physically poor but i think if you are truly truly um, poor in spirit then there's less attachment to the the riches of this world now talking about riches of this world what have you been up to in the last <laughs> few days yeah riches that's me <laughs> um last few days just work i think oh yeah. i had a day off that was exciting sorry about that didn't come into work <laughs> <laughs> that's, okay. that's yeah. good we all need rest i suppose yeah no so i've had a good few days what about you yeah, I've just been working here. And it's extraordinary for me to be in the office for so long. I've yeah. been actually here like 24 hours. And well, not not in the office for the full 24 hours, but you've been here more than one day yeah. this week, That's which right. is exciting. And I'll be here tomorrow oh. again, driving <laughs> Danny crazy because she Too likes her days. quiet. I do. I love being in the office by myself, but Janine will be here tomorrow anyway. Yes. So. so Janine is out there. Third office staff. We're four, actually. And I asked uh, maybe Amber to come in tomorrow as well. So we're going to be four. Oh, that'll be fun. Full office tomorrow. Yeah, not That's as it. much work is done when there's three of us in here. Don't tell Amber, me that. Janine and I. <laughs> <laughs> That's, this is at the FRG ministry office. So uh, just quickly, what we do a little bit here is that mm. we, we don't only do podcasts. We don't only look after my touring and, and, and uh, other sort of work that I do, but we're actually working on a big, big project right now um, to develop influence in the curriculum, to de- develop influence and hopefully reach millions and millions of teenagers. So today, when we talk about um, poverty, I wanted to talk a little bit about the poverty of Jesus. Why, Jesus why, why do we say that Jesus was poor? Not because he was physically poor, but because he was poor in spirit. You know, being human, first of all, let's start with humanity, is by essence being poor. Being human is not just a, um, a, a conception and it's not just birth, um, but it is a decision to use our, our freedom to serve others. Like, and, and this is where we are created in the image and likeness of God. God is by essence a servant. He's a servant to others. And he showed this absolute service when he sent his son Jesus and showed us how to be fully human, how to become human. He was the first example of what it means to be fully human without compromise and without sin. I once read a quote, Father Rob, and I would be interested to hear what you think of it. I am so bad at remembering how to credit quotes because I just read them when I'm on the internet, but they stand out of me. And one was that when we think of Jesus' humility, we often think of him on the cross, but then his greatest act of humility was when the creator of the universe became human, as you mentioned, like fully human. Do you agree with that? Well, yes, absolutely. But being fully human also culminated in the cross. So there is no incarnation without the cross. Yes, if you want to put it in a sense like God was in full control, he had um, all um, control of everything, he had full power, and he's giving up that power, becoming vulnerable to become a human being, but also at the mercy of other human beings, which is crazy. You create something 
something and then you become at the mercy of the thing that you created, which is an incredible, absolutely incredible act of humility and of poverty as well. To give up your power, to give up your potential is poverty. And so this is what, this was Jesus's journey, but it was a journey, not, not in a sense of just a physical event, but it was more than a physical event. Him becoming human was not just taking up a body, but it was a journey to the depths, to the poverty of what it means to be human. I was reading a book um, recently, and it's just um, a book by um, Johannes Baptist Metz. Now, this is a really old book. I, I don't even know, maybe hundreds of years old. But it talks about the poverty of spirit. And he tries to explain, this guy tries to explain the poverty of Jesus through um, the temptation, Jesus's three temptations mm. in the desert. You know, you remember what those were? Yeah, I remember. So Jesus is in a desert for 40 days, around about, and Satan comes and tempts him uh, with the bread, like turning the stones to mm, bread. So hunger, yeah. Yeah, and then becoming the most powerful. Yeah, so standing at the, um, the top, he said, I'll give you everything if yeah. you bow down and worship me. And then the third one? The jumping. <laughs> the jumping. <laughs> yes, when the third temptation, when Jesus was tempted to go bungee jumping. <laughs> no, that was, uh, yeah. The I'm th- paraphrasing, <laughs> obviously, Matthew's gospel. <laughs> he said, he said, throw yourself down from this and um, God will send angels to catch you. Okay, you won't graze your foot, you won't. So these are the three assaults that um, that Satan made on the poverty of Jesus. Because this, the thing is, Jesus, uh, Satan hates that Jesus is poor. Satan hates that he has chosen. And Jesus has chosen to become a human, a poor human being. He's frustrated, he's angry. Why would you become human? Why don't you stay powerful? Because when you're powerful, at least we know the distinction. He felt like th- that Jesus was this kind of Trojan horse. So he knew something was up, but he might not have known exactly what was going on. So there were three assaults on the poverty of Jesus. His hunger, a thirst, f- um, a hunger, a physical hunger, mm. a thirst for power, but also the thirst for d- divine. You know, the in, um, to live forever, the invincibility. And so, um, but Jesus stuck to his commitment to being human. He did not give in to those temptations. He stayed with his poverty and uh, a poverty where he had no support and no power, except for the human enthusiasm and commitment that he chose to have. Now, there's a verse, if you, Danny, I don't know if you can find this in the Bible, Philippians chapter two, verse six, which is uh, so, so key to, to what our poverty is is about what Jesus' poverty is about. All right, I found it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. So it's talking about Jesus Christ. Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness and being found in human form. Exactly. And this is this is what the devil wants. You see, the devil wants to make Jesus strong. He fears the power of an open human heart and that a, a heart that is totally dependent on God. He wants someone that is self-sufficient, self-contained, because that way he can attack. And he wants the incarnation, in a sense, the, the birth of Jesus. He wants the humanity of Jesus, the incarnation, God becoming human, to be an empty show. So sort of the divine divine God dressed up as as a human being, sort of like a, a divine puppet show. So he urges Jesus to flee from the desert. But Jesus says, no, he says, no, I'm going to stay here in the desert. He says no to, to Satan. And he says yes to our poverty. So I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter four, verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. So this is it. So Jesus experienced everything with us. He experienced the the pain, the suffering, but yet he didn't have the sometimes the consolation um, that we look for in sin that we don't necessarily we don't find, but um, we look for. So never drinking from the sin, he experienced the poverty again, the poverty of human existence more deeply than anyone that ever existed. He had no consolation, no angels, no guiding star again okay and so this is jesus jesus in his utmost poverty but he is poor not because he experiences humanity but he's poor because he has chosen poverty 
He could have moved away from the pain. He could have moved away from the suffering. He could have moved away from the, his limited knowledge. But he chose to be finite. He chose to be limited. And he chose poverty. And so again, I don't know if we can go now to Philippians 2 verse 8. We read the verse earlier on, um, verse 7. Now this this again um, it talks about the poverty of Jesus. Yeah, so Philippians chapter 2 verse 8 says, He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So that's it. Again, he chose the ultimate poverty and which is where he stepped down from his divinity and chose to die on a cross. The God who had the richness of freedom, the richness to do whatever he wants, has chosen the suffering and the finiteness of death. And he's, this is where he was fully faithful to our humanity. And he encourages us, he encourages us as well to carry out our, our own crosses, our own poverty. Because again, we have a natural inclination just to walk away, to turn away from the poverty that is within us. Poverty of suffering, poverty even of, of not having access to the resources we want, poverty of not getting our way, poverty of not knowing things that we want to know. We want to know our future. We want to be secure. But sometimes this lack of security that even Jesus had on the cross is part of the poverty. And that is why Jesus was so unbelievable. He was unbelievable because why would any people who are close to Jesus think that if they knew his divinity, they knew what he was capable of, but yet he stuck to his poverty. And so for people like Judas, for example, Jesus was unbelievable because this is why he betrayed him, because he became, Judas would have become impatient with his poverty. And he's thinking like, Jesus, why don't you use your divine resources? Why don't you reign over the people? Why don't you show them how powerful you are? And yet Judas saw this, but he became impatient with Jesus. He became impatient with his poverty. He wanted the glory. He wanted Jesus to reign triumphant. Maybe when he betrayed him, he wanted him to stand up and to, to use his richness. Thought, okay, if they attack him, then he will become rich. Then he will become powerful and strong. So in other words, poverty of spirit is often betrayed by those who are closest to it because they know, they know what God is capable of. And God calls us in response to be poor, to be poor in spirit, to trust and not to run away from our pain, not to run away from our suffering, not to run away from our humanity, and especially not to run away from our poverty. Maybe we'll finish off with John chapter 12, verse 24. And before we go into the, the interview with Father Ken Barker. I'm getting really good at finding in these Bible verses quickly. <laughs> so um, John chapter 12, verse 24, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and it and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And so this is it. This is it. When we embrace the poverty that um, Christ has embraced there, we can share as well in the resurrection of Christ. And so this is why it is an evangelical poverty. This is why it's a poverty that we can embrace because of the hope of the resurrection. Yeah, absolutely. And now we're going to have an interview with Father Ken Barker, who is the founder of a religious order here in Australia um, of priests and also a religious sisters as well. And he's going to speak a bit about evangelical poverty and why it's so important for their religious order, but also in his own personal life, what it means for him and his relationship with Jesus to take on this vow of poverty. I'm here today with Father Ken Barker. Father Ken, you founded an incredible order, the Missionaries of God's Love here in Australia. And today we're going to be talking about poverty. But before we jump into that topic, do you mind just introducing yourself? Oh, sure, Danielle. Well, as you said, Father Ken Barker, uh, I was originally a priest of the Archdiocese of Canberra and Goulburn. But uh, uh, in 1986, I felt a call to begin the Missionaries of God's Love. And... Um, so uh, I'm now uh, aging. I'm 70 years old, but full of life, and uh, hope I have still a lot more in me before the Lord calls me to Himself. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we have uh, here in this house where I'm at the moment um, 14 guys in formation, another uh, 15 or 16, I think, in Melbourne in formation as well. So that's a big job, just sort of trying to call these young guys to a deeper place with the Lord so they can take up the call to priesthood in the Missionaries of God's Love. We have missions in various locations in um, here in Canberra, 
uh, and in Melbourne, uh, in Sydney, uh, in Darwin, and, and in Manila in the Philippines, and also in, in Indonesia. Yeah, so I'm involved in all that, yeah. A big part of the Missionaries of God's Love, the vows that you take, but also how you minister is poverty. And that's our topic today. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see poverty and the importance of it in your life and in the life of your brother priests as well. Yes, well, thanks, Danielle. The way it came to me was that uh, I felt the Lord uh, calling me directly. And it was really the call uh, from the Gospel in Mark 10, where Jesus was gazing at the rich young man and he looked steadily at him and loved him. And he said, there's one thing you lack. Go sell all your possessions, give the money to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, then come follow me. And so I felt that addressed to me personally over a period of time. So I went to my spiritual director and I said, I think I meant to give everything away to the poor. And he said, well, you better do it quickly before you change your mind. <laughs> so that's what happened. That was just sort of like the symbolic expression of, of uh, a desire that was deep within me to actually give everything to the Lord, not to hold anything back, and to trust him for his provision in my life. Uh, and that began really, uh, that was really like a, a first movement of the Spirit for the missionaries of God's life, really. Yeah. So it's really about Jesus, of course, that we want to be able to express that Jesus is the ultimate treasure of our lives. That's what I, I desire. Uh, and uh, and so not to sort of be clinging to anything else but the Lord. And so it's a radical way of trying to say to be detached from earthly things so that I can be more given to God and, and really in relationship with him, in love with him. So he's the... It's, it really comes from the experience of, of God's love, really. Uh, that's, for myself, that was the key thing, that I experienced that gaze of Jesus upon me, loving me, and saying, there's one more thing, there's one more thing. Uh, if you really want to sort of be radically for me, then let go of the things that you might have had stored up in your bank account or, or anything like that, um, and, and seek me, first and foremost, as, as the, the fundamental treasure of your life. That's made such a difference for me. It's freed me up inside myself to be able to simply have Jesus first, uh, you know, not to be sort of craving for uh, other things of, of uh, comforts or entertainment or whatever that I might have wanted previously. But now I can say, yes, Jesus, you are first in my life. So it comes from that. It, there's a text in um, uh, Song of Songs 8-7, which is um, it's sort of a uh, beautiful text where it says that love is a flash of fire from the heart of God himself. For love, uh, a man is prepared to give up everything he has and count nothing of the cost. And, and, you know, and it says that love, uh, you know, no torrents can quench or no floods can drown it. So that sort of experience of God's love, that's what we'd be sort of wanting to see in the man who comes to join us, that he's so in love with the Lord that he becomes detached from uh, earthly things so that he can make the Lord first in his life. And that becomes the nugget, like, creates a space in him or encounter with the Lord ever more deeply. Have you encountered struggles with, you know, all the all the priests have taken this vow of poverty? So have you encountered struggles where, you know, it might be easier if you had a little bit of something stored up here on earth? What are some of the harder parts about taking this vow? Well, of course, you don't just sort of necessarily uh, receive this grace overnight, mm. the grace of evangelical poverty, uh, because we live in a culture where people are very attached to things and, and people are craving for more and more. So we live in that sort of materialistic culture. And, of course, guys who come to us have uh, already been formed in some way in that culture. And so it can seem like it's deprivation at first. It can seem like, oh, I have to give up that, and I have to give up that, and I have to give up that. <laughs> and it can feel like, oh, they're taking everything away. But we know from the gospel that uh, you know it's clear. Peter, Peter said to Jesus, well, you know, we've given up everything. Um, and it's like watching it for us in the world. <laughs> and Jesus said, well, you know, those who have given up, you know, father, mother, brother, sister, uh, possessions or, or for, for my sake and for the sake of the kingdom, you will have a hundredfold even in this life and in the life to come. The, the hundredfold is, is the issue, isn't it? That uh, it's a positive thing, not a negative thing. But, of course, initially you can experience it as negative. Mm. Initially it can be sort of experienced as like a hardship, as it were. But when the grace really comes to you, you actually are very excited about 
being free uh, and, and not being bound up by having a whole lot of stuff that's uh, useless anyway, ultimately. Mm. And so your, your eyes are set on the Lord and on his kingdom. And, and, and another motivation in this too that uh, we find today especially is, is very helpful is in solidarity with the poor because we we actually have missions now in Philippines and in Indonesia where we're working with very poor people. In the Philippines, it's uh, the people who were living on the rubbish dump when we first arrived there. So it's sort of like being able to be one with in solidarity with those who don't sort of experience all the the pleasures and the refinement of life that comes uh, in the first world. Huh? So that's very helpful to be able to move in that way. I remember walking down through the slums of one of the areas uh, uh, in Manila, and the people said to me, oh, Father, we want to thank you. And I said, what for? They said, well, because your priests are the first ones who have walked in our midst. So there's something about that, isn't there, yeah. that, that's very beautiful. You know, Manila is a world away from, you know, metropolitan Melbourne or Sydney, um, but that they can walk in that with their brothers and sisters in Christ is beautiful. And, you know, you mentioned that you've got 14 or 13 in formation in Canberra and then that similar number in Melbourne as well. What do you think it is about um, the missionaries of God's love and in particular with their vow of quite extreme poverty? I've been to, you know, the sisters and brothers and seen how I've seen how they live. And it's not that poverty is just a vow that you've tacked on to the end. It's really like pivotal and central to the whole formation and the whole way of life. What is it that you think is attractive about that to young people entering religious life? Well, I, I think that actually young people want to respond to the gospel call radically. I think we can sell them short. Uh, and certainly I've discovered that, um, that, that, that young people want to be committed to the Lord completely. And this is only one way, of course, of expressing that. Mm. Some will have that sort of sense within them. Yes, I, I want I want to be radically for the Lord. And, of course, it's a missionary radical thing. It's not just being radical for the Lord himself. But it's if you're radical for the Lord, then you're, you're radical for his desire to bring people to, to the experience of, of, of God. And so, like, I think the um, that's something of what happens with the... Uh, young people in relation to poverty. Um, it's uh, it's not an immediate sort of attractive thing for young people in today's uh, secular world, but when they come into it after a while, they realize, yes, this frees me. And this is uh, the, the radical way of love that I want to live. In. Do you have any, like... I don't know, thoughts on practical ways that Catholics that might not be in religious orders where they can, you know, give up everything but still have, I guess, the community to support them and things like that. What are some practical ways that they might be able to kind of embrace this evangelical poverty in their own life? Yes, because I I do believe, Danielle, it's for everybody, not to, to the extent that we give everything away. But I think it's it's really the call of the Lord, the call of the gospel. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so there's something about the life of simplicity that I think um, speaks loudly in today's world. It's countercultural. And, and so I, I think lay people, and I, I know many lay people who actually live a beautiful, simple life, not sort of cluttering their homes up with a lot of stuff, but having enough for their children especially, making sure their children are cared for and, and looked after, but then also giving their children a good sense of values so that they're not just sort of like clamoring for the next, <laughs> you know, next material toy. possession, <laughs> next toy they're going to have, you know, the one who dies with the most toys wins. Um, that sort of attitude, they're, they're sort of like, a different type of attitude, an attitude of hospitality, of sharing what they have with others, an attitude of looking out for that, the one that's um, in need and maybe uh, helping that person in need. That type of attitude, I think, is is, a, is truly in line with what Jesus says when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, that I'm not trying to just look after my own bank account and my own sort of uh, house and swimming pool or whatever, but I, I, I'm, I'm sort of wanting to share what I have with others. And uh, living simply in that regard, and also being aware of the, the bulk of the people in the world who are so poor, you know, uh, uh, materially poor, uh, not because of choice. And so that's sort of being aware of that and being able to um, you know, simplify one's life in, 
in in uh, solidarity with them. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. I've seen many couples doing that these days, which is really wonderful. I love that what you said there is that it's the call of everyone. That's really beautiful, that it's an invitation from Jesus to every Christian to get closer to him that, you know, we can live more simply. I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, and something about the providence of God, you know, uh, that's so important, isn't it? Jesus said, look at the birds of the air and the loose of the field and see how they're cared for. So why are you so anxious? Why are you so worried about things, you know? Uh, trust in the, in God's Father's providence for you. That's imitating Jesus, isn't it? Because that's how he was with his apostles. They just simply trusted that the Father would provide. Uh, and he did, of course. Uh, and that's something of, of we all need to have where there's a, a simple trust in our hearts that everything is a gift from God. Everything's a gift from God. And so I don't have a proprietary right on anything as such. It's God's gift to me. And so I live out of gratitude for this gift of God. And I think everybody's meant to live that way. Huh? And so that means we'll share readily too because we know it's not really ours ultimately. It belongs to everybody because it's God's gift to this planet. What a beautiful attitude to have. So thank you so much, Father Ken, for having this conversation today. Uh, We'll definitely be praying for you, all the missionaries of God's Love Priest and brothers and all those in formation as well, and, of course, new vocations to join the order. Thank you so much. Yeah, beautiful. God God bless. bless. Thank you so much for listening to the Catholic Influencers Podcast today. It's such a joy to have you and we love hearing your feedback. So please reach out at FIG Ministry social medias, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, or on our website, figministry.com forward slash podcast. Until next time, God bless.